Dion Waiters was born on December 10, 1991 to Dion Waiters Sr. and Monique Brown. His mother, Monique Brown, was 17 when Waiters was born and his father was in jail. The only person that helped Monique with her child was her mother, but sadly she passed away just four hours after Dion Waiters was born. Without a husband or parental figure to help raise her kids, Monique had to work extremely hard to raise her children and her three younger sisters alone in the unforgiving city of Philadelphia. By the early age of eight, Dion was almost killed on his way home from the playground. He recounted this experience by saying, when I was eight years old, I was walking across the park with my mom in South Philly when I heard, there was a shootout between some kids and we got caught in the middle of the playground. Bullets were flying by my head. I'm talking literally right by my head. The shooter was running right at us. If I was a few inches taller, I could have lost my life right there. Not too long after that, Dion's mother was on her way home from a party at the skating rink with some friends when they heard loud gunshots again. The driver started to speed away, but about a dozen bullets tore through the car she was in. As they approached a red light, she felt a burning sensation and knew she had been shot. Dion was at home waiting for his mother to return. He said he started to get nervous when he called her phone and she wasn't answering. He got his answer later that night when he got a phone call saying that his mom had been shot. Waiter says his first reaction was to start crying. Then he blew up her phone calling her over and over with no response. Then he tried to accept the fact that his mom may be dead. Luckily, because the bullet went through the car door, it slowed down before it made impact and Monique Waiters escaped with only a scar above her knee. After all of that, it turned out the shooters mistakenly thought the car held family members of their rivals and that's the only reason they were in hot pursuit. As he grew older, the craziness didn't stop. At age 12, Dion had a gun held to his head during a police raid. He tried staying clear of the drama by living on the basketball court. He said, by 12 years old, the streets knew who I was. I'd show up at EM Stanton or Chew's Playground and dudes would be yelling, here comes headache. And since I was this little cocky kid who was always calling for the ball and always dribbling, dudes started saying, man, you're giving me a headache. So that was it. I was called headache. Dion's rival on the court was a kid named Ramik. Now, remember this name because he is very important to Dion's story. Anyways, Ramik was Dion's rival and they called him the Little Giant because he was small but always played like a big. One day, he showed up to Dion's playground with his little squad and challenged Dion and his squad. Ramik and his team won and they talked loads of trash. Dion was so mad, he says he was sick to his stomach. About the situation, Waiter said, I was not gonna let my name get tarnished like that. So the very next day, Dion and his squad walked over to Ramik's playground and challenged them. Dion's team showed up, destroyed Ramik's team, and left. The following day, Ramik and his boys showed back up to Dion's playground. Waiters talked about the encounter and said, I was thinking, is there about to be a problem? In South Philly, you never know. So I walk up to Ramik and he just said, good game, bro. After that, we hung out together every day. We did everything together. I slept at his house or he slept at my house. Everybody in our hood loved Ramik. He was just a legendary kid. The other thing people knew Ramik for other than ball was skating. Roller skating was a huge thing in Dion's community and they would frequently throw skate parties and skate around the neighborhood. Ramik was the best skater in the neighborhood according to Dion and it inspired him to learn how to skate. Dion says, so for like four years, it was ball and skating, ball and skating every single day. If you were looking for me, it wasn't, where's Dion? It was always, yo, where's Dion and Ramik? He continued and said, when we got to high school, you know how it goes, things change. You start to face certain realities. Ramik was a smaller kid and he was still playing ball, of course, but he was taking a little bit of a different path. When I was 15, we got split up because I had an opportunity to go play ball at this boarding school in Connecticut called South Kent. Now, to backtrack a bit, Dion started his high school career at Bartram High, then transferred to South Philadelphia mid-year in an effort to find the right environment. He didn't play at either high school, even though by his freshman year, he was already committed to Syracuse. Even Dion isn't sure how it happened. He had been stunning crowds and wowing scouts while playing AAU basketball for a while. He also attended Syracuse's elite camp and showed out. Waiter's AAU coach later called asking if he'd like to attend Syracuse. Dion, thinking it was a joke, played along and said, sure. 
As Waiters recalls, about 10 minutes later, I was getting all these phone calls from reporters telling me congratulations. When asked why he never considered changing his oral commitment, he simply said, I'm a loyal guy. So just like that, the high school freshman from the Philly Playgrounds was committed to Syracuse University. Now that you're all caught up, let's go back to Dion getting ready to leave for the boarding school in Connecticut. Shortly before his 15th birthday, Waiter's cousin Antos Brown was shot and killed. Dion said, he was like the real big brother and I used to always be with him. Waiters remembers his mom telling him, Dion, you gotta get out of Philly for a while. It'll be good for you. So he packed his bags and said goodbye to his family and his best friends, including Ramik. About that experience, he said, still at that point, Syracuse seemed really far off. When you come from my neighborhood, you live day to day. That's how you get by. You think too much about the future and you might get your heart broken. He left Philly for the school in Connecticut in the middle of nowhere. He recalls being extremely homesick because it was his first time really experiencing anything outside of his neighborhood. On a more exciting note, he played alongside the fifth year senior Isaiah Thomas and Dion says he's the exact same height now as he was then. Waiter said, look, I'm a confident guy, but even back then, I was watching Isaiah like, yo, this dude is a killer. He led the team in scoring and I was number two. Ain't that crazy? One day, Dion was on his way to a tournament when he received a phone call that he would never forget. He recounted the harrowing experience and said, my Philly boy called me and said, uh, man, I was like, what's going on? Say it. He said, Ramit got shot. After a while, you hear it so many times, you don't even need to ask, is he dead? You can just tell from the tone of voice. I was stunned. Numb doesn't even describe it. It hit me so hard that I just broke down and lost it. Me and Ramik used to go to the park at 12, 13 years old to play with these older dudes and we've had that thing packed. People used to show up just to watch us ball. And I'm talking packed, gate to gate, just to watch some middle schoolers play. I think about that sometimes and I almost cry. There was no difference between me and him. We were the exact same. Only difference was, I went up to Connecticut at 15 and I got put on a certain path that split me from my boy. Ramik was 16 years old when he passed away and he was shot 11 times. A few months later, Dion's cousin Izia Brown was shot and killed as well. Waiter's mother said the amount of funerals took a toll on her son. Nobody expects that as a kid, trying to play basketball and deal with so much death at the same time, she said. After that, he kept his emotions bottled up. His coach, Rafael Chilius, said he was very reclusive and didn't talk very much. A lot had to do with his trust issues, but he had a million dollar smile. What he would do was, if a teacher or someone confronted him, he would more or less shut down and become even more reclusive. I told him it was all right to show your emotions, but you need to show them in a way that's conducive to the environment you're in. You can't bottle all that stuff up. Despite the tragedy, Waiters finished his high school career out at the Life Center Academy in New Jersey. When Dion finally arrived on the campus of Syracuse in the fall of 2010, he was brimming with the confidence that comes from being ranked as high as the nation's 15th best basketball player coming out of high school. The only relationship that Dion had with the bench was that it was used for resting as the coach talked to you. He definitely didn't know what it felt like to be sitting on it as the ball was tossed up for the opening tip. He expected to be starting in the backcourt with his cousin Scoop Jardine. What he didn't expect was to be sitting while sophomore Brandon Treesh, the 132nd ranked player in his class, continued to start at shooting guard alongside Scoop. Trish had started every game the previous season. While he had a nice season averaging 11.1 points, Waiters clearly felt he could do better. The thing Waiters didn't understand was Coach Boheem's loyalty to his veterans and dislike for tinkering with the starting lineup. Waiters averaged only 6.6 .6 points in 16.3 minutes per game in his freshman season and didn't seem to care enough to play any defense. He called his mom to vent about his anger at the situation and said that he might try to find another school that would play him. She came to visit him when she could just to try and calm him down. His mother said, Basically, he was getting mentally broken down. I told him, this is not high school ball. This is a higher coach than what you've been dealing with and this man knows way more than you do. I kept encouraging him and told him he'd be fine. 
At their meeting after the season, Boahim told waiters to get used to coming off the bench because Trish would be starting again next year. He told Dion that he needed more of a commitment to defense as well. Rumors were rampant that waiters would be transferring. Dion finally put his pride aside and tried to listen to the old coach. He recommitted to the program in the offseason, hitting the gym three or four times a day back in Philadelphia. His muscles grew to the point that he was down to 4% body fat. He came back to Syracuse in the fall of 2011, leaner and no longer caring whether he started or came off the bench. His minutes went up from 16 per game as a freshman to 24 as a sophomore. His points went from 6.6 .6 to 12.6, rebounds from 1.6 to 2.3, and assists from 1.5 to 2.5 per game. Most importantly, his attitude was tremendous. He smiled and cheered his teammates on and had a great time on the court. On the defensive side, he became a fiend, leading the team with 1.8 steals per game. He accepted his bench role so fully that he was named Big E Sixth Man of the Year. Waiters says this experience transformed him from a boy to a man. Waiters was so dominant for his team, despite his bench role, that Ohio State focused on him more than any other player when the two teams met in the NCAA tournament. The Ohio State assistant coach, Jeff Bowles, said, Going into the game, he was the one I was watching on film. Some of the stuff he did, you were very worried about. He had the ability to put points up in bunches. Coach Bohem said, he's more ready for the NBA than any other guard I've ever had. Waiters had also been called the best scorer available in the whole draft. Despite all the praise he received before the draft, there was some concern about the young prospect out of Syracuse. He played zone defense at Syracuse and he came off the bench. With these concerns in mind, a team in the middle of the lottery reached out to him and promised to draft him if he was available. He agreed and decided not to work out for any other teams. However, the mock drafts showed Golden State taking him seventh overall and the morning of the draft, Cleveland expressed interest in waiters. The Cleveland Cavaliers ended up taking Deion Waiters fourth overall in the 2012 draft and he hit the ground running in Cleveland. As a rookie, he played in 61 games, starting 48 and averaged 14.7 points, 3.3 assists, and one steal per contest. He hit a career-high 33 points that season and was selected to play in the Rising Stars Challenge along with Kyrie and some other teammates. He came off the bench in that game to score 23 points for Team Shaq. During his rookie season, he missed 21 games over the year due to injuries. Still, among first-year players, he ranked second in points per game, fourth in assists, and fourth in steals. Numbers good enough to land him on the NBA's all-rookie first team and get him an invite to the U.S. national team's minicamp in Vegas. The next season, he approved on a great rookie season as the highest scoring bench player in the Eastern Conference, averaging 15.9 points. The 2013-2014 season was a rough one for the Cavaliers, though. Coming off of an ugly 29-point loss to the Timberwolves, Kyrie Irving called for a team meeting and things got a little heated. Every player had the chance to speak, but when Waiters was given the floor, he criticized Thompson and Irving, accusing them of playing buddy ball and often refusing to pass to him. Thompson was offended by Waiters' words and went back at him verbally. The two confronted each other, but teammates intervened before it could escalate into a fight. Chris Broussard from ESPN wrote, Waiters and Irving are not close. Waiters believes the Cavaliers have a double standard when it comes to Irving, sources said. Waiters feels that while Irving is allowed to get away with loafing defensively, making turnovers, and taking bad shots, he is taken out of games for such things. Waiters has shared these views with Brown and Grant. Not long after, Dion Waiters lost his starting spot to Matthew Della Vadova, and the Cavaliers began shopping Waiters around. On January 5, 2015, Waiters was traded to the Oklahoma City Thunder from the Cavaliers in a three-team trade that also involved the New York Knicks. Waiters had a very poor debut for the Thunder against the Sacramento Kings where he scored four points on one of nine shooting. But he got in the groove over the season and tied his career high 33 points in the team's final game of the season. Waiters said, when I got to OKC, me and KD were together every day. Kev used to think it was funny because when we got in the gym and played one-on-one, -on -one, I was trying to kill him, straight up. During the 2015-2016 season, Dion had a bench role playing back up to Andre Robertson and averaged 9.8 points for the squad. Life was going well for Dion, and he enjoyed living in Oklahoma and playing alongside such great talent. Dion said, 
I was at home in Oklahoma City, relaxing in my man cave with my two-year-old son. We had just sat down on the couch and started playing when I got the call. My phone is always on silent, but for some reason, I just so happened to look down and saw my homie trying to FaceTime me. I picked up and all he said was, you heard? I said, heard what? He said, they say your brother got shot. They say he's lying out there in the street. I didn't believe it. I called my homie back and I'll never forget what he said. I'll never forget it. He said, they've confirmed it's him. My son had never seen me cry before. He was still playing with his toys. He didn't understand what was happening. He said, Daddy, why are you crying? Death feels so familiar to me. By the time I was 16, I had lost three cousins and my best friend, Ramik. Now my brother was laying dead in the street and all the same feelings and thoughts came rushing back. You all should know the name Demetrius Pickney. This is what I want you to remember about his life. We called him Zeke. He loved to dance. He was always smiling and making the best out of life. I watched Zeke grow up from being a goofy little kid, always crying. He was the biggest mama's boy in the neighborhood, and the one thing he loved was riding dirt bikes. That's the thing for the kids nowadays, especially in Philly. In the summer, when I was back in Philly, we would kick it every single day. I was trying to show him another way. I kept telling him, stay off the bike. Don't be riding it where you know you shouldn't be. We have this expression. We say, stay out the way. It just means chill. Don't put yourself in a bad situation, just stay out the way. That's the thing that I keep replaying in my head over and over. If I was home, I know it would never have happened. He wouldn't have been on that bike on that block. He would have been with me. We would have been chilling, eating some good food, watching some TV at the crib, staying out the way. It plays on my conscience every day. If, 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 if I was home, Zeke would have been with me. If he had been with me, he would still be here right now. Before I left, I told him, I specifically told him. My last words to him were, I love you, I love all y'all. Stay out the way and stay off that bike. I felt like I was this close to reaching him. It still hasn't sunk in that my bro is really gone. Every day I reach down to my phone to text him and then it hits me, he's gone. 10 days after Zeke's death, I was back in Philly with my team. We were playing the 76ers. I came out the tunnel at the end of the game, just like I always do. My family was waiting for me in the stands, just like they always do. But my bro was missing. It didn't even feel real. He always texted me the same thing before every one of my games. He would just text, turn up. You know I will, bro. I miss you. Rest in peace. Waiters became an unrestricted free agent that summer and fielded offers from different teams. He said, when I heard that Miami was interested in me this summer, I really wasn't seeing it at first. Nothing against the heat, but I didn't know how I would fit in there. Then I met Pat Riley. He's sitting there looking like a boss with his hair slicked back in one of those real OG suits. I knew right away that Pat was a real guy because he wasn't even asking me about basketball. He was asking me about life. I told Pat about some of the stuff I've seen and some of the people that I've lost. I told him that by the time I was 12 years old, both my mom and dad had been shot. I've had brothers, cousins, uncles, and friends get murdered. Too many to count, for real, and I was numb to it. And that's just a slice of the life I've lived. Normally, I don't like to talk about this stuff, but when Pat Riley asked, I had to answer. He ended up signing with the Miami Heat on a one-year deal with a player option for an extra year. He started the season off well, but unfortunately went down with an injury in November that sidelined him for 20 games. Dion Waiter said he was seething mad. During that time, the Heat slipped to 11-30 and, and fans were suggesting that they tank for a good pick. Dion responded to this and said, Come on, man. As long as I'm on the floor, you know what we're not doing. He set his mind to getting the Miami Heat's record back on track. He said, when I came back in January, I was so locked in, it was crazy. I kept telling everybody, all we gotta do is win seven or eight in a row and we're right back in it. Dion shared a compelling story about the win streak and his notorious game winner versus Golden State. He shared and said, I remember we played Kevin Durant and those boys in Golden State and I had just come back from my injury. I was going at Kev hard that night, but they beat us. We went out to dinner after the game and I told him, bro, we're about to go on a run. He was looking at me like, yeah, okay. I said, nah, I'm serious. We're about to rip off seven straight. He said, 
Yeah, but we're coming to Miami in two weeks. I said, yeah, that's a W. He was laughing his butt off. We got back home and won three straight, and then Kevin, those boys came to our building. We gave them everything they could handle. We weren't scared. I saw right away how Kev was playing me, like he was daring me to shoot the ball. I told him, bro, I'm feeling good. Have you seen the last four games? Y'all are in for a long night. We were talking trash like we were playing one-on-one -on -one back in OKC. Fourth quarter, 10 seconds left, tie game. I got the ball in my hands with the game on the line and I already knew what was gonna happen. Forget an overtime, let's get up out of here. I pulled up and that was a W. Then I hit him with a pose. People ask me all the time, what's that mean? It don't mean nothing. It's just the Philly in me. People say, why is your confidence like that? It's because I've beat some of the harshest things anybody can ever go through. I'm not scared to take the big shot because there's only two things that can happen. You're gonna miss it or you're gonna make it. That's really why my confidence is like that. It has nothing to do with me just being this cocky guy. I've just been through so much that basketball is the easy part. Man, if you've been through what I've been through, you'd be happy to just be alive. After that, we ripped off 13 straight. Nobody wanted to see us in the first round. Look, I know we fell one game short of the playoffs and it kills me. If I hadn't gone down with an injury, I think we all know where we'd be right now. But you know what? The run this season was magical. Our fans sold out the arena every night, even when we were left for dead. Over his final 25 outings, 21 of them wins, he averaged 18.4 points on 46.7% shooting and 44.5% from the three, and averaged 4.8 assists. So that's the story of how a little kid survived the murderous streets of Philly and made his way to the NBA in spite of the abundance of tragedies set before him. Although he's making millions on the sunny beaches of Miami, he still has not forgotten his roots. He remembers all the people close to him that have been murdered and thinks about how none of the killings have been solved to this day. Still, he says, I wouldn't change anything about anything I've been through. Sometimes you just wish, man, what if they were here to witness everything that's going on? Just being at a game, seeing me live my dream out, that's the only thing I think about. Dion returned to Philadelphia and talked with one of his old friends named Tap, who is now a sports director at the YMCA in North Philly. Tap said, the violence here tore through our group of friends, but Dion kept out of trouble because he was always on the court. One time, I saw waiters at the playgrounds sleeping on a bench with the basketball while I was on my way back home from a party. One of Dion's elementary teachers named Eileen Heller recalled that he would walk the halls with a basketball in his hand. Dion used the basketball courts as a refuge from the killers that lurked on every block. That's part of the reason why he started the Dion Waiters Foundation and returned to his old elementary school, E.M. Stanton, and pledged $10,000 to the renovation of the playground. He said, I just want to serve as a role model for the kids in a tough neighborhood. I'm playing for more than just basketball. I'm playing for the people that aren't here. I'm playing for my friends that aren't here, my family that's not here. It's deeper than basketball. He didn't speak much at his old elementary school, which was less than two miles from where his brother was shot. He just closed his speech with one simple yet vital statement and sat down. He said, the streets don't love you back. I know, I know. Oh man, y'all did not expect that. I know you guys did it. It was like tragedy after tragedy. I'm like, dude, how many of these do you have? But yeah, that's why it took me so long getting this out. Like literally spent weeks working on this. So I hope you guys liked it. Like it if you did. And check out my other Before the NBA videos. It'll be the first link in the description to the playlist. I have like six other ones. And I do other videos besides Before the NBA. Okay, so if you want to subscribe and watch those videos, you can. Okay. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see y'all later.